just want to give the welcoming uh, to Rez Moari and uh, thank you for being with us today for this very interesting session. And we are looking forward to learn from you and engage uh, and discuss about uh, this monitoring evaluation uh, technique. Okay, so thank you, Cecilia, and uh, good afternoon, everyone, everyone that has joined in today. Uh, we look forward to uh, sharing together and sharing our experience uh, during this QIP study in Kajiado, and I hope that uh, I will learn something from your uh, sharing, and I hope that you can also learn from the experience that we had. So I don't know if Cecilia, I proceed and get started. I think you can go. Uh, what my uh, invite to everyone is if you would like to introduce yourself in the chat box, who you are, where are you come, calling from, and please do while uh, we go along, feel free to add in the chat box any questions and uh, even uh, feedback you would like to then uh, later on discuss uh, within the group. So feel free to interact through the, the chat box. And go ahead, Rosemary. Okay, so maybe uh, to start with, I can just give you a little bit of the project background. Uh, Feed the Children has been implementing adolescent nutrition campaign activities in Kajiado, which is in Kenya. And these interventions for the adolescent nutrition campaign were targeting girls that are in school and girls that are out of school because of various challenges as a result of the environment in which they have grown up. And we were reaching out to them with messages on nutrition and life skills and how we were doing that for the girls that were in school, we would do that through the nutrition clubs in schools. And for the girls that are out of school, we were doing the messaging through the care groups. And the care groups is an approach that Feed the Children is using to share health and nutrition messages with um, caregivers of children. And then uh, uh, we, we got a, uh, some, some funding boost from Sun CSA that enabled us to do some extra activities for the adolescent girls, but also one of the activities that, that was funded in that grant was this QIP study, among other things. And so uh, for the adolescent girls uh, uh, project that I just introduced, we, uh, we, we, it has two broad objectives. And the first objective is to reduce early and unintended pregnancies among the adolescent girls. And the other is to promote optimal nutrition for pregnant adolescent girls. And now uh, for the QIP study that we are discussing today, our general objective for that study was to assess if the campaign is achieving its intended objectives among the adolescent girls. And uh, we were going to do that within the community health units that uh, Ministry of Health works with. And in this case, we were going to do that in, in uh, two of them, which is Oloidilai and Engaboli. And then we were going to also do uh, the study within three schools that we selected randomly. Uh, and these schools were also located in the community health units that I have just mentioned. Then for this study, we had three uh, main, three key research objectives. The first uh, research objective was checking, have there been any changes? You are interested in both positive or negative in the, in the respondents' lives over the past year and a half. And like I mentioned earlier, our interest was the in-school and out-of-school adolescent girls. The second research objectives was what do the respondents perceive to be the drivers behind these changes? So we were interested in knowing what is this that was driving the, the positive or the negative changes that the girls were experiencing. And the last research question was whether uh, these changes in any way are linked to the adolescent girls campaign or they are in incidental to, to the campaign. 
And so to, to give us, you know, some boundaries around our study, we, we looked at the domains of change, the kind of change that we, we were expecting to find in the lives of the girls. And under the first objective of reducing early and unintended pregnancies, uh, we thought that the change we expected to see in the lives of the girls was a reduction in pregnancies. And we hope that maybe some of the girls will not have any teenage pregnancies. We also hoped that there would be a bit of extended years at school because for adolescent girls in Kajiado where this project is located, even one extra year of school counts. And then we also hoped that uh, the girls that are in school, there would be some improvement in the retention because then we hope that they wouldn't drop out of school uh, for various reasons like marriage or a pregnancy. And in the second objective on optimal nutrition, the change that we hoped to see uh, was optimal nutrition status for pregnant adolescents. Because in the event that these girls indeed got pregnant, we hoped that they would have some optimal nutrition. And then we hoped that we would see uh, girls consuming at least five of the 10 food groups. So those were the changes that we hoped uh, we would be able to see. And so our study was being designed ar around these domains of change. And then the study population, uh, the study was designed to uh, have respondents drawn from the adolescent girls who are in school, like I mentioned earlier in the three schools, and then uh, adolescent girls who are not in school because they're either married or they are just not in school for various reasons. So those were the two categories of our study population. And then uh, just to take you through the methodology, the quick methodology in, in just briefly, uh, there could be some of us here that are asking, what is this QIP? And it stands for Qualitative Impact Assessment Protocol. And it is a methodology that is used to measure, that we use to measure the impact of the campaign. And then QIP methodology generally is considered to be a simple and a cost-effective way to gather, analyze, and present feedback from intended beneficiaries. And the kind of feedback we get is on the significant drivers of change in their lives. And then the QIP, QIP gathers evidence of a project's impact through narrative cost or statements collected directly from the intended project beneficiaries around the significant drivers of change in their lives. So in this case, we needed to ask the girls themselves about you know, their stories of change. So respondents are asked to talk about the main changes in their lives. And then of our predefined recall period, in our case, it was one year and a half and prompted to share what they perceive to be the main drivers of these changes. So we had questions just uh, giving the girls a chance to tell us some of the changes they have experienced and to whom or what they attribute those changes to. In some cases, it will be multiple sources so we just wanted to hear their stories of change. And then QIP's primary objective is to explain the variation in the well-being outcomes experienced by the intended beneficiaries without quantifying the average effects. And what that means is that we are not going to present, QIP does not provide us with you know, a percentage of this or a percentage of the other. Rather, it just gives us the drivers of change that uh, based on the stories that the girls have shared and it, it, it gives us a record of the stories based on the changes that the girls have experienced. So today, you're not going to see any percentages of this or the other, but you're going to see summary of factors that have driven the changes that the girls ex have been experiencing as a result of the adolescent girls campaign that uh, we were implementing in Kajiado. Then uh, the other thing that I would like to bring to your attention is how we selected the cases that we studied. In QIP, we do not take a sample. Rather, we select cases that would give us a variety 
of factors or a variety of stories of change. So in this case, and based on the methodology, the requirements of the methodology, we interviewed 24, uh, we, we did 24 interviews. And then we also undertook four focus group discussions, which we conducted in the local language. Uh, and then we used highly skilled and uh, local researchers. So in this case, uh, we did not do the interviews in Maasai uh, because the girls that we were interviewing were able to speak in, in uh, Kiswahili. So we used uh, Kiswahili language. And then uh, we used uh, staff uh, coming from Feed the Children who, who are new in the organization. So uh, we reasoned that that would be the best way to be able to meet, to have a good blend between skill. And also these members of staff, most of them were also Maasai speaking. So in the event that they encountered a girl who could not speak Kiswahili, they would still be able to undertake the interview in Maasai. Then the research team conducting the interviews uh, was independent and blindfolded. And what uh, this means is that, uh, like I have said, they were all new staff. They were like probably a month or two old in the organization. They had very little knowledge about the project that was being evaluated. And the respondents also were not aware that the, the interventions that they had been receiving from Feed the Children were being evaluated. And so that is what we refer to as braidfolding. And this is for the purpose of reducing on the bias and making sure that uh, the girls, the respondents do not tell you the things they think you need to hear because they know you have come from a particular organization that is keen on certain things. So, and then uh, the selected cases uh, captured as much variations as possible in their responses. And that's why I will show you just shortly, uh, we try to distribute them in the different areas of the three community health units so as to be able to capture as much variation as was possible. So uh, regarding how we selected the, case, the cases that uh, we interviewed in this, in this QIP study, we applied two contextual variables. We looked at age and the schools where the girls were coming from. And so we divided the age category into the younger adolescents, that is the girls who are aged 10 to 14 years and are still in school. And then those that are 15 to 19 years and also that are still in school. And then we distributed the, uh, the, the interviews into the three schools, which is Mopia, Inkati, and Enos. So those are the two uh, variables that we applied in selecting the cases for the study. And like I said earlier, the purpose is so that we can be able to get you know, uh, the, the stories of change from girls from school A, which is more peer, and also get uh, the stories of change from girls that are coming from Inkati, and also get the stories of change from the girls that are coming from Enos. So it was important. And also based on their ages, we think that their stories of change would have been different. If you're a younger girl, maybe your story of change is different from if you're a, an older adolescent. And then for the out of school girls, uh, we applied to contextual variables, we applied the community health units that I mentioned at the very beginning. So and then we applied the village cluster. So we took the villages in the two in the in the two community health units and clustered them using a criteria that we developed together with Jane. And then uh, so we made sure that uh, the interviews that we would undertake uh, took into consideration both the cluster of villages and that we had respondents coming from both of the community health units. I don't know if so far, I trust that we are all uh, fine so far. Then uh, we also undertook uh, four focus group discussions and how we selected the representation for the focus group discussions. Then we made sure that we had uh, church leaders uh, present because then we know that 
the church leaders have quite a bit of you know contribution to the lives of the adolescent girls we made sure that we had some youth ment mentors and champions we made sure that we had representation from teachers from the schools where the girls are going to school also we uh, we made sure that we had some allies also uh, participating in the focus group discussions and also the community health uh, volunteers that uh, work hand in hand with our staff in Kajiado in uh, regards to messaging the adolescent girls. And then uh, for the data collection, we had two tools. The first two was a semi-structured household level questionnaire which is what uh, we used for the interviews with the girls. And this questionnaire had generative questions. Those are the ones that were just for starting a conversation with a girl, just having general questions about their environment or their situation. Then we had open-ended questions and we had supplementary questions. And all these questions were framed around the outcome domains of change that I shared uh, uh, earlier. So they were, they, were, they were around the issues of nutrition and the issues of their health in regards to uh, cutting down on early, early pregnancies or unwanted pregnancies or unintended pregnancies. And then we had a focus group discussion guide as well. That was to help us be able to have a standard tool to apply during the focus group discussions with the cases that I just mentioned in the slide before. The main aim of these two tools was to elicit stories of change among the adolescent girls. And also it was to be able to sustain and deepen a conversation about the changes that they have observed in their own lives. And also to expose causal statements leading to root causes. And I'll be showing you that as we look at the findings about some of it that the girls uh, shared with us. Then uh, when it came to the data analysis, uh, we used an app that is called Coso Map app, which, uh, which, has, which is an online research tool that can be used to code uh, qualitative data or you know qualitative uh, scripts. And then it's the same uh, app that we use to analyze. And it is the same app that helped us to visualize fragment, fragments of the information about what causes what into what we, 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 you will see later in the findings. And, and it helped us to present all this data into uh, maps so that you can be able to view some of the segments of, or rather the factors that the girls shared as being the drivers of the change that they have experienced. And so this COSO map, it is a tool that can help any social researcher and program evaluator. And if you would like to look at your text and you would like to be able to map the factors that are causing this and the other, and, and, and you want to be able to map that into a, a, a map, this is a good, uh, a good, uh, app to use and this app was made available to us by Steve I hope that Steve you may have attended the workshop or the webinar and he made it available to us to use it on a trial basis while it was still under development and so we really appreciate you Steve if you're here he had promised to be in attendance and so it's available for those who would be willing to use it and I have put his um, email address there just in the event you would like to use it or learn more and all that it's the email is right there. So uh, on the issues of the data analysis how we did that mostly it was to develop codes from the statements that uh, the girls had given us during the conversations when they were sharing their stories of change also then to cluster those codes so that we could build common themes uh, from the many stories from the 24 interviews and also from the focus group discussions. Once ha having done that, then it was the next level was to come up with the different outcomes or factors 
that were driving the changes in the lives of the girls and then uh, build course of uh, claims and maps, which we are going to be sharing with you today. And then uh, the results that we are going to share were in this broad, mainly these, uh, I think there are five broad categories. We had some results uh, around their health and issues that are, are, were affecting their reproductive health. Then we had we have some results we are going to share today around uh, nutrition, their food consumption habits, and what are the drivers of, of change around those areas. Then also we had a bit of uh, uh, sharing from the girls in areas of household relations and how that is affecting uh, their food consumption habits. Then we had community relations and how that also is affecting both their nutrition and also their health uh, issues. And eventually we will share with you the external relations. And that is, uh, they will, uh, I'll show you some of the uh, places or organizations or other places where they attributed the, the, the change to. So I'll be sharing that with you in the, in the survey findings. So we can start by looking at the interview dynamics and uh, worth noting is that the interviews were undertaken uh, to explore the direction of change in the different domains of the well-being of the adolescent girls in the past one and a half years. And then interviewing the adolescents was, was both interesting and intriguing with the dynamics of adult interview shifting greatly. Remember these are girls and they are young they're young people so uh we found that it it was not possible to apply the same dynamics that we apply for adult during adult interviews therefore there was need for the researchers to first try and build trust with the girls and sometimes that took even longer uh, than norm than it would normally take if you're doing an interview with an adult because you have to make sure that the girl relaxes and settles down and all that and and after that is it's that is now when you can actually undertake that interview then we had a couple of challenges during the the, the interviews uh, one of them was in some cases we had to seek consent from both first the respondent asking the girl, would you be okay if we did this interview for you? But also in some cases from the parent and in the cases where the adolescent girls were married also from their husbands. So it was many, many types of concepts, concepts that were, were needed. And then also in the Maasai community where the respondents are drawn, were drawn from, it's not unusual to find adolescent girls who are pregnant who are pregnant, who are mothers or are married. And so sometimes uh, people coming from organizations, uh, the community would react with suspicion when they see that you would like to engage the adolescent girl privately, like in an interview, because of the government child protection policies that may have been broken in instances like that. So we, we encountered a bit of suspicion and we had to assure the the parent or the husband, as the case may be, that we were just simply there to hear the stories of change in the lives of the adolescent girls. And we were not really there in at that instance as agents of government. But uh, it is worth noting that we had an excellent response rate. I don't think any of the girls that were, uh, that were selected uh, to, uh, as cases uh, for the study uh, none of them really declined or said they did not wish to share their stories. Then uh, now I'll share based, uh, the results based on the various uh, thematic areas. And the first one is the food consumption and availability. In this study, we sought to explore the drivers of change around this outcome on food availability and its impact to the health of the adolescent girls. And what we found is that there were many co uh, coastal pathways that linked food consumption to food availability, to how much the food costs, to livestock production, to whether the household had income, and also to seasonality. Because we found that the girls in, in, in their interviews, they, they seemed to link all those things. 
what they ate was very, very much directly related to whether the foods were available in their households or in their communities. They were very much related to how much these foods cost. And so the markets around where the girls lived also very much related to the uh, to livestock because this is a, a livestock uh, you know community it's a pastoral community and uh, they sell livestock to be able to buy food and whether there is you know money available in their homes and also drought because then when there is drought we found that and the animals died it had an effect on uh, their, their their food consumption habits, and I have put there just a citation from one of the interviews from a, a, a girl that is in school, and she said she had lost much weight, uh, but she had started regaining it, and this was as a result of insufficient food at home for the past year, which resulted from the death of our livestock, which are our main source of income. So this is just an example of the many cases of the many instances where the girls did link a lot of these things together. The other thing that I would like to mention is that um, the above mentioned drivers affected the food consumption habits of the adolescent girls, both in school and at home. Because then we find uh, a lot of the adolescent girls in school uh, did a meal at school over lunch, while the girls uh, that were out of school were doing all the meals at home. So those factors have a way of affecting uh, uh, the, the food consumption habits of the girls in whatever the environment, whether it is home or at school. And so it would be important to be able to influence what uh, those factors that I've cited there above, if we have to change the food consumption habits of the girls. Then uh, also worth noting is that there is need for a holistic approach to adolescent girls uh, programming because then uh, we have to be able to affect all these factors that seem to affect what the girls consume. We cannot say we are only going to teach the girls and we are not going to be interested in how much the food costs in their areas. We are not going to be interested in livestock production. We are not going to be interested in the availability of income at the household level. We, we, we might need to think about having a more holistic approach towards adolescent girl uh, programming. And then I think I cannot overemphasize the fact that livestock was a key driver of change in food availability as shared by the girls. I don't think there was a single interview that we did where they did not say, oh, uh, because of availability of livestock, therefore we were able to have more food or because we could not, our livestock died, therefore we had less food. We, there was a lot of talk about livestock uh, by the girls. And I have put a citation there from a, an interview uh, of an out of school girl. And he, this is what she says. Uh, uh, this is because we get some from the market since the father sells domestic animals and he buys food. So you can see there's quite a bit of linkage between uh, livestock and the food. And I think we might want to think about how to be able to uh, affect all these factors that the girls were talking about as drivers of the changes they have experienced. Uh, other factors also that the girls uh, talked about many, many times was the increased nutrition knowledge to counter indigenous knowledge. And they kept on mentioning, I have been taught at, at the club in school about what to eat. I have been taught in the care group about what to eat. And there were, I think almost every other interview we had this, uh, this mention, and I've put a citation there as well about a girl who says, and this is an in-school girl, who says, uh, the reason I have been getting a lot of food varieties is because I was taught by a health person. She taught me as an adolescent to take five out of 10 types of foods a day. I don't practice uh, much in school, but I try at home and I get varieties at home than in school. So you can see uh, the issue of nutrition knowledge uh, is something that the girls said has been driving the, ch uh, the change, the change that they have experienced regarding food consumption. And the other thing also that they talked about a lot was the um, uh, sources of income at the family level. Uh, and I think I have mentioned that earlier and there is a citation 
just showing some of the ways some of the ways in which the girls thought if their family has some source of income it has a way in which it improves their food consumption and availability and then also they, they, there were many girls in the interview that in the interviews that talked about competing priorities in the household. Like they said, my mother is sick. Therefore, all the money is going to taking care of my mother. We are not able to buy enough food for the family. So also other competing priorities in the household have a way of you know, competing with the, with the food consumption and availability uh, needs in the home. And so uh, as we were talking to the girls, I have put here for you one of the COSO maps about some of the factors in detail that they shared that affected, uh, that that affected uh, their food consumption by reducing it, that reduced the food consumption. And you can see uh, they, they did mention uh, things like lack of money, which I have already mentioned. Livestock also comes up as I have already mentioned. Uh, there are issues on uh, mother sick. Those are uh, pri priorities that are competing uh, um, with other things. Resources directed to hospital bills, seasonality that you can see there are drought seasons also mentioned, death of livestock, income. I think I have already brought all those things to your attention. And then uh, issues around uh, what they eat at school and what they eat at home. And they need also to sensitize the schools about how they can also improve on you know the the what they are providing, especially for the borders. The, the girls that were uh, borders, they kept on saying, while at home, I'm able to do uh, to eat some, you know, to eat according to the lessons that I have received. At least five food groups in in boarding. I'm not in boarding schools. I'm not able to have a lot of control over that. And so, in summary is to say that we received both negative and positive changes, mostly revolving around the vulnerability of the livelihoods in the community and the over-reliance on livestock as a way of providing food to the households. Uh, while we anticipated the girls would be the change agents in their households regarding decisions on food consumption, this community remains patriarchal and hence fathers make most of these decisions. That is something that the girls kept you know, telling us. And so uh, in conclusion on this slide, I think it may be worth exploring the need to involve adolescent uh, boys in adolescent girl campaigns so that we can build future change agents in the home. And then we can build more support for optimal uh, food consumption at household level. Then uh, uh, in regards to improved food consumption habits, uh, the respondents were consuming more food varieties as indicated by the drivers presented in the table uh, that I have, uh, have put here. You can see uh, we had a, a lot of girls who uh, brought up drivers and brought up factors that, uh, that indicated that they were consuming more varieties of food. They were consuming uh, more than three food groups. We, there are girls who told us they were eating more balanced meals. Uh, other girls told us they were eating more food varieties and the numbers are here in total. We had a lot of girls who told us they have improved their food consumption hab habits. And I have also put a bit of citation here just some from some of the girls who, who told us, I can just read one. Yes, the food she eats, this, this, this came from a focus group discussion. Yes, the food she eats has changed. She takes extra meals and different food groups for more milk, for more production of milk. So this must be a breastfeeding mother who shared in her, in the interviews that uh, she was consuming more food groups. So we can, prob we can therefore say uh, the girls did share with us change stories that indicate that they have had improved food consumption habits as a result of uh, the, 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 the campaign. And then I have pressed here uh, so that you can see some of the factors they shared with us uh, on a map. And you can see uh, they seemed to link the food consumption habits to their health. And here are so many uh, factors that the girls shared uh, that indicate that they are actually consuming more food groups, as I have just shared in the slide before. And so uh, they, they say they were eating varieties of foods. 
uh, they said they were they were having to, they were getting plenty of food, especially when it rains. Uh, others said uh, they were able to get more food because they would sell the sap. They, they would sell the surplus. Others said they were they were consuming more fruits and vegetables. So you can see uh, the messages that were being shared were having, uh, the girls were able to tell us good stories about their food consumption habits. And it seems to be stories for the better they're consuming iron rich foods and so forth and so on. And so this map does summarize the numbers here are the number of girls that uh, cited a certain factor as uh, sort of like affecting their, their, the changes that they have experienced regarding uh, their food consumption habits. And then on another theme that uh, came up during this study on the overall well-being of the adolescent girls, this study sought to assess the perception of the well-being of the adolescent girls. And we, we received both positive and negative drivers of change, some of the key drivers uh, of negative change. For that girls brought up were in, in the instances where they, uh, they, 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 there was a teenage pregnancy, uh, sort of it, it did affect their well-being negatively. That's what they said. In the cases where they dropped out of school, it also uh, affected their well-being negatively. And also, um, as a result, it shattered their dreams. And I have put here a citation from a girl who said she, feel, she felt emotion by the time of the interview, she was feeling emotionally demoralized because she dropped out of school due to pregnancy. Uh, she was bright in school and this has made her lose hope. Uh, and she's feeling sad that her classmates would finish school ahead of her. But on the other hand, we had positive drivers that uh, the girls shared and they talked about peer support mechanism, peer, you know, like girls supporting each other in the clubs and in the communities. They talked about capacity building for adolescents. So all these training opportunities that uh, we are, that are available for the girls in the community. They talked about guidance and counseling and appreciated it so much as something that, you know, makes them feel feel better and they, are, and they also improve on their well-being. There are those girls also who shared about the birth of a child as being something that improved their overall well-being, especially the girls that were already married and also those that were uh, other cited marriages as something that they felt was a positive driver of change in their lives. So again, I think we, we would still want to emphasize that it is good to have a multisectoral support to adolescent girls so that we can find you know, a holistic way of improving their general well-being. Because then you can see uh, the field of how their well-being is improved is broad. It goes from things that can reduce on, their, uh, on, on school dropouts to things that can help them improve on their health and so forth and so on. So a multi-sectoral approach would be probably be a good, a good way to go. And then here is just a map also drawn from the COSO map uh, that shows some of the factors that the girls uh, brought up, which I have summarized in the slide uh, uh, before. Uh, just talking about things that uh, they felt improved their well-being. And I think I've tried to summarize that in the slide uh, before. Then uh, on the household economic status, as I mentioned, the girls really brought up the issues of the economic status of their household being a, a big driver on how they on what foods they consumed and the availability of those foods. So uh, the main drivers of change around household economic uh, status were found to revolve around the household's ability to have a source of income, either through livestock or farming activities. Those were the two main things the girls mentioned, livestock and farming activities. And then through these activities, the household can provide food for consumption. Other respondents shared that the surplus livestock and farm products would be sold to purchase food. And this was in reference to milk because then milk is sold by the mothers and it, once they do that they're able to buy some 
some you know uh, variety of foods for the for the household the respondents also viewed ownership of assets as a sign of improvement of the economic status in their families and this also associated with the provisions of food for the family. And then on, on the free uh, side, the girls shared conflicts as being a cause of communication breakdown at home. And this was seen to be an impediment to the stability in economic status of the household. So those are some of the things that uh, the girls are shared. And here is a, a map that can summarize some of the things that uh, sorry, some of the things that the girls, uh, the factors that uh, the girls shared as driving their change, they, they, they said family conflicts were things that they felt were, were contributing to the worsening economic status of their households. And therefore, if the economic status of the households is bad, they're not able to, uh, to, have, to, to have the kind of foods that they would need. Uh, the fathers not being able to take care of the families adequately. I mentioned that this is a patriarchal community uh, of a dependence on the father when the mothers are not able to have any economic activity. Issues of livestock came up, issues of surplus income came, surplus income came up and all those things around that can generate some income for the family. Also the girls raised them as factors that are affecting the economic status in their homes and therefore affecting the purchases of food and therefore affecting the food consumption habits. Then also uh, around the issues of improved community relationships, we sought to assess the perceptions of the girls regarding the community relationships and how facilitative those are to adolescent health. And uh, this, the reason was because uh, uh, Feed the Children uses a community focused approach to promote behavior change. And the girls did share some of the key uh, drivers. I picked some among the many that they shared. And you can see uh, there were many girls that gave uh, factors like community assistance to ad adolescent girls to return to school. Once the, uh, a girl is foreign pregnant and she has uh, gotten a baby, they, they were happy uh, to say that when, when there was community assistance that enabled them to return to school, it was something that was good. Then uh, import, uh, community teaching the girls on the importance of, of, of education and other organization also doing the the same. Then they talked about uh, uh, interventions to curb uh, school dropouts. They also talked about that and also talked about interventions to make sanitary towels available to them and then people coming together to support one another. Uh, uh, it's amazing that we were talking about uh, nutrition but girls kept bringing this uh, on over and over and you can see we had about 22 girls that were raising these issues and I would still say we would still need to think about some of these things because then there are things that also improve on the well-being of the adolescent girls. Then we talked about also the issues of the household uh, relationships and uh, we, uh, the household relationships were on two fronts. For the out of school uh, girls, the husband was a focal point of reference. And for the in school girls, uh, the, the parents, the mother and father were the focal point. And so in this map here, uh, you can see some of the things uh, that the girls brought up. There were issues around decision making, who it is that makes most of the decisions at home. Remember, even food consumption uh, habits in the family are also matters of decision making, where most of those issues were, most of those decisions were being made by their fathers. There were some, in some cases, we could see that mothers were, the, the girls uh, said their mothers were making minor decisions. In other cases, girls were also involved a bit in decision making. Some of them uh, shared that. Uh, there was, uh, they brought issues of uh, other issues outside nutrition, like when there is no harmony at home and there, there, there is violence in their homes. They talked about fear in the way that they were relating to the boys in, uh, the boys in their schools and in the community. They talked about cultural segregation of roles in their homes. They, they brought out all those issues around decision making and how people relate at the household level. And so in most cases, the males made majority of the decisions, even on food consumption, while interventions were applied to the adolescent girls. 
they had little or no role in decision making on food consumption in their homes. So we might want uh, in the next phase of this project, we might want to be able to see how can we influence these factors? How can we, uh, how, how can these factors that the girls uh, shared with us influence also the messages that we share with the mother, with the fathers and with the, with the mothers and especially with the fathers so that they can probably better involve even the girls and better involve even the wives and the mothers in their home. And, and then we, uh, we have this slide here on pregnancy and childcare and a review also at the changes that the adolescent girls who are mothers had experienced in ANC and PNC for themselves and in protecting the health of their babies. And there were conceptual factors that were explored were improved health of the adolescent, of the adolescent, improved emotional health of the adolescent. We had questions that were looking at some of those issues. We had questions around reproductive health, and we had also questions just about their general health. Adolescent girls sh uh, shared uh, changes attributed to knowledge, which influenced the practices positively. And many of the pregnant girls or mothers of the adolescent reported that they had improved their dietary practices so as to be able to care for their babies once they had uh, gotten them. And so in okay. this uh, map... Rosemary, sorry if I can't... Yes. Just I was wondering if um, we can uh, uh, keep a few minutes for some question and answer discussions. Uh, okay. making sure we keep a little bit of time and asking people if they can stay since we started uh, five minutes later, five, min five minutes longer. So we can uh, give the time to Rosemary to uh, complete the presentation and then spend a little bit of time for um, discussion. Sorry if I cut out. Please go ahead um, for a few minutes. And then as soon as you conclude that we can have our question and answers. All right, so I'm actually uh, coming to the end. Somehow I think this is my like um, almost the ending. And so these are some of the factors that the girls raised. Uh, you can see there was a linkage between uh, food consumption and they said uh, the things that were driving them to uh, eat better was so that they could be able to uh, better take care of their babies, better do exclusive breastfeeding, uh, so there was a linkage between that and also a linkage between the improving the health of the adolescent girls. They thought by improving their health, uh, they would reduce the, the complications they have during pregnancy and all that. So there was that linkage that the girls were sharing about food consumption, their health, and also being able to take care of their babies. And then finally, this is my final slide. Uh, we had asked, we were asking them to name the most important external agency that had contributed to their stories of change. And they gave us a whole uh, list of many, but you can see uh, Feed the Children here uh, had, had been mentioned more times than the rest of the organization. So we can attribute and say that uh, Feed the Children had contributed in a big way also to the, uh, to the stories of change that the girls were sharing. And so I think that sort of like brings us to the end of my presentation. I think as I have been continuing, I have made uh, some of the recommendations like making having a bit more of male involvement in adolescent interventions. Uh, I think I have also made the, uh, the, 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 the recommendation as I continued on an integrated approach that addresses more holistically the needs of the girls. Uh, I think I have mentioned uh, most of the uh, more partnerships so that they can also benefit uh, the girls because our partnership with the Bath SDL was beneficial in this, uh, in this uh, process. So more, we only stand to benefit from you know, more solid uh, partnerships. And so I think then I come to the end of uh, my presentation. And then as uh, Cecilia has advised, I think we could take in questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Rosemary, for this really um, in-depth uh, 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 glance on how you have been applying this uh, approach and the findings and absolutely uh, interesting from uh, on how from a, a few um, uh, research questions you somehow really understand 
uh, the diverse uh, scenarios that is really driving the change of adolescence and it's really interesting. I do have a couple of questions, but I already seen that there is a question in the chat box and I'd love to um, perhaps give her the time and the space to anyone who would like to uh, come up with questions to just raise the hand and feel free to open the microphone. Perhaps I can, um, uh, Masood, if you would like to uh, read your questions, uh, I can do it for you, otherwise feel free to open your microphone, I can give you the space, um, if you would like. Sure, uh, sure, yeah. thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Hey, uh, hi Rosemary, a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant presentation and very interesting set of findings. Uh, well, uh, really good. So I had like very, very uh, quick set of questions and some of them were around methodologies as I was going through uh, a different element of your presentation. And I was thinking because I am also currently supporting another equip in Zimbabwe. So that's that's why it's probably coming from a, a, as another researcher who is doing quip, right? So yeah, I mean, feel free to ignore, like, you know, if you don't have enough time for all of this thing. So I'll quickly ask my three questions and uh, you, you can pick and choose which one to answer now. So the first one is around uh, getting the consent. I noticed you said, for some of the participants, you had to uh, get consent both from the adolescent girls and their legal guardians, whether their parents or husbands. So my question was, why for some? Why not? Why not we do it for everyone? Or was it? Uh, was it for? Uh, was there like any a very specific reason? Because I, what I was thinking, because all of them are underage, so legally they are children, so we should be getting consent from everyone, right? So that's question number one. And I think like, you know, you probably have the answer. The second uh, one was around uh, uh, around like that local researcher. So I didn't get that part uh, very clearly. So you said uh, they are independent, but they, you were also saying they are uh, feed the children's uh, internal stuff. So what I got is their new stuff. So you can consider them as, as sort of like, as if they are like outsiders or am I, am I getting it wrong? So that was the second question around uh, the local researchers. And the third number was when you were talking about the food consumption habit of the girls. And I noticed that a big number of the girls were also saying their food consumption has gone down. Uh, they, they have like less food availability, right? So it's less than, uh, less than the people who said positive things. I think positive was like 38 or something, but negative was 31. Still, it's a big number. So I was wondering, have you explored uh, what was the reason uh, for this negative responses and you know what kind of uh, girls like you know are responding these things are they coming from certain age group certain certain locations and stuff so sorry i'll i'll stop uh, babbling uh, and that's that's a lot of questions but thank you again uh, for this brilliant presentation and good to be here thank you okay. masood um, rosemary would you like to take a, another questions for somebody else or you would like to uh, answer straight away just let's see. I think if, uh, let me just let me let me first respond to yeah. uh, this. Then we can take another one. Yeah. I think you're right. We actually got consent from for all the girls from their, their themselves and their legal guardians. I think I meant to say where the girl was married, then we got the consent from the husband. But where the girl was not married, we got consent from or from parent. So I think you are right. We did get consent, uh, both from the girls and from whoever it was that was a legal guardian or husband or yes. So the other thing on uh, the local researchers, uh, uh, again, I need to explain it just a little bit. We were trying to have, we had a tricky balance to make in this case. The tricky balance was that we needed to have people that were good at doing uh, qualitative interviews. And then we did not have a very large uh, budget to be able to undertake a very rigorous training. So we did not consider recruiting uh, researchers from out, you know, from outside our organization. And so this is what we, this is a decision that we made because then we had just recruited a team of staff that were very new in the organization. Barely, they had barely completed their orientation. So we thought this 
were independent enough because then they did not really know these girls. They did not probably know, um, the, the, you know, the, the, the interventions that were being applied to these girls. So we, we thought because of our limitations of the budget uh, that we could work with this uh, team of our new staff because then, first of all, they are professionals in the line of nutrition. So then they would be able to understand the questionnaire much faster. And then the fact that they were also Maasai speaking, most of them, then they would be able to uh, navigate scenarios where the girls would not be able to speak Kiswahili. So that was the balance that we tried to, to have. Ideally, I think it would be good if you can get somebody totally independent, like outside the project. But in our case, we were lucky to have uh, had some recruitment done not so long before we commissioned this uh, study. And then on the issue of the negative factors that are affecting food consumption, this is what we uh, decided to do when we were developing the questionnaire. We had a, a section of the, we had a set of questions in our questionnaire that were asking for the things that have negatively affected their food consumption. And the reason we did that is that we wanted to give every girl an opportunity to tell us her story of change around those moments when they have not had enough to eat or they have not eaten the, 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 you know, the, the, the required food groups. And the reason was because we wanted to be able to use uh, the factors they will give us to redesign the messages that we were going to be sharing with the girls in the subsequent phases of the project. So uh, we, we wanted to be able to receive both the negatives and the positive feedback from the girls as they shared their story. So this was really like deliberate so that we could be able to hear from them on also the, those times when they're not able to have all that they, they need for their dietary diversity. So thank you, Cecilia. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I just wonder, I, am, um, I recognize we are over time, so just want to see if anyone else has had a, uh, any burning questions, anything you would like to expand in terms of, um, um, yeah, the, the, the technique has been applied and uh, some of the uh, areas um, presented. So just give the time to anyone to open the microphone and... Uh, Hi, yes. Uh, so my name is Clement, yep. and I work with Feed the Children and uh, uh, the ME department uh, in Tanzania. And thank you very much, Rosemary, for such an impressive uh, presentation. But I just wanted to know, uh, do you see any possibilities uh, for like future studies of the same kind? And if yes, then what are the areas that would, would you recommend uh, that someone should look at? I think this is an excellent question, uh, Rosemary, and, and I think maybe on that I can couple uh, my uh, as well question just to give you lots of the time to uh, conceptualize. So, and uh, replicating this uh, uh, approach or this type of um, methodology, what is that you would uh, really do or do better? And what are the areas you have to keep in consideration and also to avoid to make sure that um, the study um, is as much as useful as possible um, in, a, in, a, in a way, in a situation where you want to uh, do it again. Okay, so uh, in answer to your question, Clement and Cecilia, I think yes, QIP is an excellent uh, uh, methodology. And yes, we can use it in many other, you know, areas where your interest is in hearing uh, the stories of change from the perspective of the beneficiary without necessarily having um, our usual type of studies where you, you, you get, you know, proportions related to the general population, but where you just want to be able to hear what is the experience, you know, uh, your, your, your beneficiaries are having on certain things. So I wouldn't really limit it and say you can only use it in this field or that field. The thing is, I think it can work for basically any health or any nutrition, you know, behavior that you would like to hear stories of change uh, about. In regards to probably what we would, what we would be able to do better, I think uh, I had a limited time when I, when I was working with the trial version of the COSOMAP, 
I had 30 days to be able, actually less than 30 days, to be able to um, uh, code the data, do the analysis, because I was trying to work on a free app. I think into the future, maybe it would be nice where it would be maybe more relaxing and more useful if uh, we would be able to have, you know, that app available so that, uh, you know, we can even run further analysis even uh, after after the study. So that probably is something that uh, I could I, I would look at. And then also uh, maybe uh, Maybe also uh, getting opportunity to share uh, the results much more, maybe also with the with the, our nutrition counterparts at government level, just so that we can see if it's something that you know can be adopted even at that level. So generally, I think that's how I would quickly just respond. Over to you, Cecilia. Thank you. Thanks, Rosemary. Um, I see the hands from John. John's hands are raising. Uh, do you wanna? Share briefly, briefly any uh, additional comments. Let's take a one more minute um, uh, before we close. I think this is a really rich presentation. So please go ahead, John. Yeah, thank you, Cecilia. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Rosemary, for a good presentation. Um, mine was just to uh, follow back on what you've mentioned and the question on what next for this uh, study or the recommendation, the study results. And I was just going through some of the studies that I've done across the world, and we only have about uh, three or four countries. That's Peru, uh, Bangladesh, and um, a few other countries that have done studies on adolescent um, nutrition, and of course, the behavioral aspect of uh, uh, adolescent nutrition. So um, to tighten up that comment is just to look at how this study can get into the fore for different, like the Lancet series that normally uh, carries out publishing of uh, quite a number of uh, studies that are, uh, are done and how we could use this as one of those avenues that are both uh, practical program implementation, um, advocacy, and how uh, it, the results can be used now to change either the messaging and how to you know, strengthen some of the programs that are upcoming. So it will be interesting if, this, uh, some of this uh, recommendation of the whole study and the outcomes are published. And of course, uh, given the limelight of, of what is happening in Sub-Saharan Africa, that, uh, or rather with the, with the mention of Kenya as a, as a country. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks a lot, John. Absolutely. I think uh, more uh, learning to, go ahead, to do around uh, find these findings to then apply them in our work. Great. And then that's also like a, one of the recommendations was coming out from Rosemary last slide that is really connect these um, findings with uh, the new uh, planning, new interior change of the same organization, but also others. So decision making uh, that are in the phase where they have to shape their new intervention, the new policies, et cetera, be provided with this information to be able to, and also being aware that probably if a program cannot cover the holistic approach, making sure that is covered by strategic partnerships that are uh, probably working around uh, other areas that can contribute. So this can also help us in working better with partners that we know they are also very much contributing to the same um, to the same goal. I love how, from a specific perspective, you were actually looking for changes around nutrition behavior, and you got such so much more, so much more connections um, that probably wasn't really strictly connected to the specific campaign. But you have to do something about it. So um, definitely continues this learning. And I really appreciate, thank you for the presentation and the time, Rosemary. And, and uh, I'm sure there is a lot of other areas we might want to explore and find out more. Uh, we will be sharing the recording and the presentation on the San Civil Society website. So feel free to uh, very soon um, go there on the resource page and find it uh, or on the Facebook group, don't worry about it. And then please, um, Definitely, if you will want to continue uh, on this approach, I'm sure there will be opportunity to contact, connect with, uh, with uh, Rosemary and colleagues that have been practicing to, yeah, to build on uh, this uh, very good um, um, 
uh, approach that has been already piloted. I just want to remind you that there will be another webinar series uh, in a month's time. And this time we will be exploring uh, uh, monitoring um, uh, uh, utilization of fortified uh, flower and, um, and behavior change around that and legislations. So uh, will be another uh, eye around the meal techniques. Um, so I hope to see you there and I hope you will continue your discussion around this and I want to thank you, Rosemary, for your time, your availability and this wealth of information. I'm personally really, really interested um, in how you apply this and as you said, this is something that you can apply in so many other fields. So thank you again for sharing and then we'll definitely continue working together um, on this path. Thank you everyone for attending the presentation. And then, uh, and thank you, Steve, as well, to make available this uh, wonderful application and uh, technology that makes our life easier to make sure that the voice of people can be really utilized for our planning. So thank you for uh, making available this um, technology to us and we'll hopefully more people will be able to utilize it as well. Thank you all. And I will hopefully see you in a month's time. Thank, Thank you, you Cecilia. Cecilia, and bye. And bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.